Welcome to Cheese In Depth. I'm Michael Landis, and I'm very, very pleased today to be able to bring you our final episode of the Bourbon Heritage Month. This is part four with Adam Harris, uh, the senior ambassador for Basil Hayden. And uh, we are joined by a very good friend of mine, an exceptional cheesemaker, David Gremmels, today. And we're going to be tasting this year's, the 2020, uh, the um, Rogue River Blue, along with a couple little special parts along the way as we go through here. And uh, I'm very, very excited. I'm going to turn it over to Adam, and he's going to start off, and then we're going to jump right into the pairing. So, Adam, if you'll be pleased to take over. Absolutely, Michael, my friend. It has been so much fun this whole month as we've been celebrating Bourbon Heritage Month here in September together. I have had the best time being able to share Basil Hayden's with you and with all of your viewers and friends. Uh, you know, we've, we've run quite the gamut over the last four weeks. We started off with our bourbon, uh, you know, our tried and true bourbon here, which is part of our small batch collection at our distillery in Claremont, where we've been making uh, small batch bourbon for well over 25 years. Really, it was our sixth generation master distiller, Booker No, who really innovated the small batch category of bourbon whiskey. And uh, we continue to innovate in the category as well and to rye too. And so as we've sort of gone on this journey together, we've experienced not just bourbon, but also some rye. We've experienced some cool finishes. Uh, I think David's got one today with our little port finish on the dark rye. And then today what I wanted to bring, since we are kind of at our, at our peak of this program, uh, I wanted to bring some really special whiskeys along. I have both a bourbon and a rye, and I have our 10-year-old bourbon and our 10-year-old rye. Uh, the 10-year-old bourbon is something that we did last year. We, it was so popular, we decided to repeat it. And then also our 10-year-old rye is a new uh, release that just came out this summer. So hopefully those of you that have been following along and sort of seeing what the lineup was going to be, maybe you've had a chance to find some of that rye on the shelf wherever you might be shopping, safely, of course. So um, just a little bit of review for everybody that maybe hasn't been tuning in, but, you know, as we're celebrating Bourbon Heritage Month here, it always helps to, to understand what bourbon is, you know, and so bourbon is an American-made product. We're celebrating it this month, as we should be celebrating it all year long. I certainly know I do. Uh, bourbon has to be made of no less than 51% corn. Bourbon has to be aged in a new unused charred oak barrel. Uh, bourbon can't be distilled any higher than 160 proof, put into a barrel any higher than 125 proof, and then put into a bottle any lower than 80 proof. And everything that we'll be trying tonight or this afternoon is uh, 80 proof, as Basil Hayden is known to be a very approachable bourbon. And that's exactly how we want it to be, whether it is a bourbon or a rye. And then last but not least, bourbon is a very genuine product, meaning that it's just water, wood, grain, yeast, thyme, and a little bit of love. And if you're putting all those ingredients together in the right way, you are making some fantastic bourbon or making some fantastic rye if you switch that grain component to no less than 51% rye. So all other standards of identity are going to stay the same. Sorry if that was a little bit of review for some of you, but uh, if you're just now tuning in, then maybe you just learned a little something. So uh, Basil Hayden, as I mentioned, 80 proof, approachable. Uh, not every bourbon needs to be a challenge. Not every bourbon needs to be big and bold. You know, I love some of those big, bold flavors myself, but every once in a while it's nice to refine back a little bit and have something uh, that really might be a little more playful, which is what Basil Hayden is. And one of the reasons why Michael and I have been having so much fun is because we're really enjoying opening up people's perceptions to what goes with bourbon. You know, we're certainly focusing on cheese, but as the holidays start to come around and maybe the cooler weather sets in and you're looking to have, uh, you know, select people over, uh, being able to have fun with the way you entertain is, um, you know, always a good idea. So being able to bring some really great fine Kentucky whiskeys, whether that's going to be one of our bourbons or rice with Basil Hayden, and then being able to see how well it pairs with cheese and how some bigger, bolder cheeses, like the one that we're going to try today, are going to stand up to that bourbon or rye. And then with 80 proof, the bourbon is really going to complement that. It's not going to overpower the cheese, but it's going to be enough of uh, alcohol there to really sort of cut through some of the cheese as well to where maybe you don't feel so weighted down after enjoying a little too much cheese or a little too much whiskey. So anyway, uh, what I want to bring to mind right here, uh, just for a little bit of visual inspiration as we get into the whiskey tasting here, I thought as we're uh, talking about this home entertaining, I wanted to show you some recent pictures we took of our fantastic spreads that we'll be serving throughout the holidays and as we entertain. Uh, on any given reason. You don't have to be just the holidays. I, I think Friday makes a perfectly good reason, or even Thursday afternoon makes a perfectly good reason. 
And then working our way through there for a little bit more visual inspiration. Again, we're featuring our Basil Hayden uh, traditional Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. I'd like to introduce you to a real fan favorite, which is our Basil Hayden 10 year old bourbon. As I mentioned last, uh, just a moment ago, we did release this around the holidays last year and it was so popular that I didn't even see a bottle of it. It came and went lickety split. And so with that popularity in mind, we are bringing it back uh, this season. And as you'll notice from what I'm holding here as to what you're seeing in the picture there, we put a black belt on the bottle this time. And I thought that this was a very fancy looking bottle when we did it last year. And the fact that it didn't have a black belt, it was kind of like wearing, um, you know, wearing a, uh, oh, heck, cheap shoes with a tuxedo, right? So I think having that black belt along with the black label really brings this bottle together. It's beautiful and lets you know that you're about to drink something pretty spectacular. So the tasting notes are as they is, as you guys know. Uh, I don't sit around telling you exactly what to taste. I like for you to follow your own uh, spirit and uh, choose your own adventure. But, you know, with bourbon, we're going to look for some of those vanilla and caramel notes. Um, as we all know, Basil Hayden is a high rye bourbon, which means that we do add a little bit of spice. I've used the term elegant spice quite a bit to describe that note that we get in Basil Hayden. Uh, 10 years old is quite a bit older than what you might know our traditional bourbon to be. So we have uh, you know, a handful of years of extra age on that whiskey. And as bourbon ages in a warehouse and those big 53 gallon barrels, what we'll start to see is a decrease in the oaky notes and we'll see an increase in the vanilla notes and we'll see an increase in a little bit of the char notes. And so at 10 years old, you're gonna have a really nice vanilla component to this bourbon as it's aged. Uh, the rye is going to start to go down a little bit too in that 10 year, um, that 10 year age and you're going to get a really nice balanced, full flavored but soft palated our soft textured bourbon. Um, the mouthfeel is just really fantastic here. And I think uh, someone just called me on accident. So uh, let's go ahead and as I like to do this three uh, part system for tasting, we always want to look in the glass first. 10 years old at 80 proof, we're going to have a nice uh, deep honey color here. Um, now as we nose it, there's gonna be some fantastic vanilla and caramels, as I mentioned. There's gonna be some brown sweets in here. And then I also get some fruit, kind of candied fruit almost, like a little bit of a fruitcake thing kind of happening. And then as we sip the whiskey, uh, we'll go ahead and give it that Kentucky Chew that we've been using these, uh, this month, and we'll see what we think about the flavor. I definitely get some of those baking notes. I get some of those candied fruit notes. Um, get a little bit of oak coming through and we have that nice, dry, medium body finish. Nice clean finish here too. Well, lingering a little bit as well. So maybe I'm reevaluating my own tasting notes as I'm tasting this again. Um, what I'd like to do now is uh, send this over to David who is going to lead us through a little bit of a, a tasting of the cheese and an introduction to Rogue River over there. And then we'll uh, talk about how to put these uh, whiskeys and cheeses together. So, David? Adam, thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited to be a part of this beer urban flight and rye flight. Uh, certainly one of my favorite browns um, in the world is drinking a, a fine glass of bourbon uh, every season of the year, as you've described. And there so- you know. Speaking of seasonality, this is um, really an exciting season for us at Rogue Creamery. Uh, it's the launch of Rogue River Blue, and you all are the first, really, to receive it. And the difficulty is, is as you may have heard, um, I, I live in Southern Oregon, and so our region was impacted by the Almeda fires, and so that really has shut down the region um, and shipping via UPS and FedEx. So um, the farm, the creamery, uh, and our dairy are safe. And most importantly, the team and the herd are safe. So um, sadly, four team members lost their uh, homes and uh, we're doing a fundraiser. So we'll follow up uh, with, uh, through Michael and, and give you a link to support our team our teams as they uh, start to 
rebuild their homes. So um, anyway, thank you for joining. Uh, as you may or may not know, uh, Rogue Creamery was established in 1933. It's 87 years old. Um, and uh, we are a B Corp. We're one of Oregon's first B Corps. And that is using business as a force of good, socially, um, economically, and environmentally, having a positive impact in all that we do. Um, we're a mission-driven company. Our mission is simple. It starts with people first, people dedicated to sustainability, service, and the art and tradition of creating the world's finest handmade cheese. And we do have that in our flight, I'm happy to share. So uh, we'll be tasting that at the end of our tasting here. But to start, uh, I wanted to start with the cheddar that we've shipped to you. This cheddar is just aged over three years. I think it's actually approaching four years now. It's called Mount Mazama, named after the mountain that was over Crater Lake, which blew and created this um, glorious lake called Crater Lake, one of the deepest lakes in North of America. It's just pristine. So Mount Mazama, Mazama translates to goat. So we um, actually are utilizing 20% goat milk in creating this cheese with um, cow milk. And it's non-standardized, non-homogenized. So the milk from the dairy goes directly into the vat. So the less we do is really a reflection of the landscape, what our cows and our goats are both grazing and browsing, as well as um, the climate of that period of time, nearly four years ago. Um, and so it's really a reflection of place. So very simple, but what I get in this cheese, as you'll notice, you'll get those uh, crystals. We have both tyrosine and lactic calcium crystals in this. So I like to say they're rock candy, right? As the proteins start to break down, they formulate crystals on the edge of the cheddar. So you might have noticed these little kind of translucent white spots. Well, those are tyrosine crystals, but in the inside, we have the lactic calcium crystals. And that's when the calcium will start to form and crystallize and really just create these wonderful, robust crystals that have a phenomenal melt. And you're thinking you're tasting crystals now. Wait till we get to Rogue River Blue. It'll be it's really a blast. So um, again, I like to smell the cheese, see the break. You can tell it has a lot of age. So there's not a lot of elasticity in this cheese. So it has some really good age. Um, and develop a paste in the mouth. And what I get uh, beyond the crystals is I get that hint of goat milk. So a 20% ratio of goat milk really um, gives you a little hint of the goat flavor, but not overpowering. But the sweetness of the cow milk comes through. So you get that sweet cream finish that just continues to um, extend and I get a lot of grass notes too. So um, it's really just one of those sensual um, cheeses that I think it hints upon um, a lot of vanilla notes as Adam pointed out in the bourbon we're going to taste and also toasted notes, which you also pointed out. I like to think of it as toasted marshmallows. So that just perfect brown toast of a marshmallow. So um, it's just like the perfect combination. So shall we just bounce us back to tasting it with the bourbon? And yeah, no, I, I, think, uh, I think it seems only right at this point that we should. Um, what, I, what I think is great, I, I love that there's a, an initial salinity to this cheese, but then also that just mellows out so nice into some of those more grassy, or herbaceous flavors. And I think that, and the, and the way that it finishes too in that vein, I think that with this Basil Hayden bourbon being a high rye bourbon again, we're going to be emphasizing some of those herbaceous flavors that you will get from the rye. So mm -hmm. uh, I think this is gonna work really, really well. The way that I like to do things, I like to take a little sip of bourbon first, kind of let that uh, flavor wash over your tongue. And then I like to uh, take a little bite of cheese 
And as David said, I like to form that paste. And then as I begin to kind of take in the cheese, I'll wash it down with a little bit of, of bourbon as well. And I think that letting those aromas kind of ruminate in your transgeminal area and being able to get that retro and orthonasal thing happening where you're able to get more flavor and aroma, I think you're going to really enjoy how these go together. I'm very excited. And so as you're doing it in order, as Adam has described, I like to do it in a different order. So if we can do it one more time and see if there's a different organoleptic note um, that comes out. So maybe we'll get a little bit of fruit or maybe we'll get fennel seed or something. I don't know. But what I like to do is take the cheese, create a paste, and then add um, the bourbon. So I think starting as Adam shared, starting with the bourbon, then the cheese, and then let's start with the cheese and the bourbon, sure. if there's a difference, shall we? I think, let's do it. I'm gonna go get another piece of cheese. Now, I've watched you chew bourbon, Adam. Should I be chewing my bourbon? <laughs> yes, so that's what we do. We like to, we like to chew on our bourbon a little bit uh, at the distillery mm -hmm. there. So it kind of, I, I love the fact that it, it gets the flavor of the whiskey, whether it's gonna be a bourbon or a rind, gets it all over your palate there. And then what I do too, is I smack a little bit when I've swallowed it in order to bring some air across my tongue. And then it's gonna help kind of activate my taste buds with a little tingling to that aeration. And it's, it's gonna be a good indicator of how the finish is. Is it kind of clean and medium or is it long and lingering? And then, you know, as I was kind of real time expressing the, the flavor or the finish of the bourbon, it is a, a nice lingering finish, so. I think that these go really well together, and I think the it's it's a very dynamic pairing because tasting the bourbon first, you know, there's a lot of what to expect there, and and then the cheese starts to take on a very bright uh, flavor, and then putting those flavors together as you bring them together to to finish, it just really is this dynamic flavor bomb that I thought was really really tasty, and I I just love that or that grassy note that it finishes with, and it really kind of, it's, it's carrying along with the bourbon's finish. So I think that's a, that's a pretty good pairing. We should definitely try it your style now. Yeah, yeah, and um, I just went ahead, I stepped ahead, and, and certainly I understand why a bourbon maker would want the bourbon first, because that's the first expression you get. But as a cheese maker, I really want that expression to lead with the cheese. So, mm -hmm. uh, so either way, works but you're getting a very different experience so i get the fruit i get the vanilla i get that really expressive uh toasty nut note coming through with the bourbon up front and also um that that hint of heat too so you know it's calling for me to have that piece of cheese and then yeah. also the cheese will express itself um, and then if we reverse that and take the cheese first and create that paste in your mouth and then add it, it's a more subtle approach to the bourbon. I, I don't get as much of the uh, bourbon notes, but I'm really certainly getting a lot more of those cheese notes working with the bourbon characteristically. So it's uh, really enhancing I think and elongating both flavors. So um, your method really brings out the fruity notes too. Like the right. fruit of the bird really kind of just pops in that in that flavor bomb that I was saying. And that's that that is exactly what that is. It just really brings out the fruit. And that is that's I, you may have changed my my uh, pairing methodology. Well, and I'm I'm certainly going to use your chewing notes in my pairing. So and then <laughs> let's take it again. It's a collaboration because uh, you all who have um, uh, the tasting kit uh, received also the FE oat crackers and just love these um, oat crackers and then layering a piece of the Mount Mazama and then I think taking the Jacobson blackberry honey. Uh, blackberry honey is, is really one of the rarest though I mean, I look out on my farm, I see a lot of blackberry hedges I have to go after and control because they will take over a fence line. <laughs> now, is the blackberry honey, is that, is that honey infused with blackberries or is that bees that have sort of pollinated and, and enjoyed the blackberry bush? Yeah, that's a really good question um, and thank you for asking it. It is based on bees actually uh, um, 
gathering the pollen from the blackberries in bloom. So it's an awesome. early summer to midsummer honey. So seasonality again. So uh, yeah. a honey. We work that, with a, we work with a, an organization in Chicago called Roof Crop, and they have uh, different urban gardens all over rooftops in Chicago area. And then we work uh, we have we we sponsored a, a beehive. And so these beehives go around these roof crops and they, uh, you know, gather the pollen from various herbs and things like that. And the honey that we've gotten the last two years has been really spectacular, just really cool minty notes to the honey. And it's just uh, one of those things that, you know, there's certainly honey experts out there, we all know them, but, you know, to be able to try various honeys based on what the, the local flora and fauna might be, it's, it's a really, really cool experience that I, I think is kind of underestimated, but probably not by the crowd watching this show. I think that people don't really fully understand like how different dynamic honey is out there in the world. Mm. Yeah, no, and similarly, Jacobson's is gathering honeys uh, from urban and rural environments. Uh, so they do uh, rooftop gatherings as well of honey um, and, and then honey in rural areas and farms such as where I live. So yeah. it's a great partnership. Um, and of course, we need the pollinators uh, for a robust harvest of fruit and veggies. So yep, yep. Uh, all about protecting those pollinators. Uh, mm -hmm. but what did you think? Talk about fruit. The um, flavor of that blackberry honey just, I think, really accentuates um, the uh, fruit notes that come through the Mount Mazama, but it's also balanced with those savory notes of the oat cake. And then adding the bourbon is just like, wow, it's just so yes. toasty and delicious. And I see on the cake there. more fruit in the yeah. bourbon. Too. <laughs> this is a match. I love it. Yeah. Those oat cakes are dangerous because they kind of, they scratch a big itch for me, which is that balance of salty and sweet, you know, right. and it's, they are, that is really good. <laughs> really good. <laughs> yeah, I love those. It's yeah. such a great way to serve cheese. And so... Um, and I think that's really a delightful pairing with the Jacobson's um, blackberry honey. And blackberry honey, again, is a rare honey, just a short window of time that it's gathered when the um, bees are out there gathering the pollen and then it's harvested in midsummer. So uh, we're really excited to share it with you with awesome. the Mount Mazama and also the Rogue River. An awesome, uh, an awesome tasting kit that you guys were putting together. So thank you. I hope everybody's enjoying at home. Good, good, Michael. I know you have a few words here. The pairing master. So, oh, you know, I, I, you've said it all. You guys are just doing such a great job. I am enjoying just being able to sit here and and enjoy the, the what everybody's put together. This honey. The crystallization of this is really interesting. Uh, you know, it's it's not something that, you know, you knock this over and it's not going to pour out. It's right. very, very thick in that. And then you're putting it on, you know, I love Effie's, you know, and uh, uh, Irene and Joan are just the best of the people in the world. And I think their biscuits are, you know, I have them on all of my shows because they just do so well. But this cheese just brings out everything. And, you know, as, as working with a 10 year old and the boldness of this bourbon, they just don't even, it doesn't even budget. It just all stays together. This is fantastic. I rate this as one of the uh, well paired groupings of everything that comes around here because nothing's being lost. Everything stays together. They hold up to each other. And I have to be honest with you, is that I can't wait to dig into the Rogue River Blue and, uh, and see what it does with this bourbon as well. Absolutely. I think I'm gonna get a little silly here, but the way that you were talking about the balance and how they, stay, how they just work together really well, it's almost like I've got a bucket of really, really great bright blue paint and David's got a bucket of really great bright red paint and we splash it at each other at the right time this beautiful purple appears you know it's like it's just that it's just 
it's powerful. The, the flavors are big, but they just work together so well. Yeah, that's a powerful pairing. I agree. It really just accentuates the flavors of the bourbon. And I have the classic signature um, bourbon in my hand. So I'm very excited to have this in Southern Oregon. Um, and it just works brilliantly. All right, well, the Rogue River Blue I created in 2002. Um, and really, it was an idea I had to encapsulate the flavors of this region that I live. And those flavors are, of course, it starts with milk. And um, milk is a, really a reflection of landscape. Um, and the health of the soil, the health of the waterways. And our dairy is actually um, located uh, adjacent to the Rogue River. So that is our source of irrigation. Um, and it's just such an idyllic place for the dairy and for our cows to graze. It's, it's so special and so beautiful. The cows are uh, grazing on just luscious fields at this time. And this is our premium grass season. So. This is when both solids and proteins are equal. Uh, it's about 3.5%. And it's, it's ideal for making cheese. Our yields are optimum, but our volumes are lower. And therefore, we have an enhanced flavor. And I thought I wanted to create a special cheese using that milk. And so the cheese is uh, aged in our 87-year-old caves. Um, and in those caves are an abundance of, of fungus and molds that really leave a regional impression on the cheese. And uh, the gold pink hue that you see at the rind of your cheese, that's created by yeast and B. linens, Breve bacterium. Those are naturally occurring to this region. We're, not applying those, um, they're in the air. It actually comes from the soil, inoculates our milking parlor and our, our milk holding tank and then our make environment. So that is a regional flavor. And so to preserve that delicate rind, I felt like I needed to um, wrap it with an edible, uh, an edible leaf. Uh, so this, area that I live, um, there are a number of vineyards growing warm weather grapes and uh, I focused in on Syrah grape leaves after taking a wedge of Rogue River uh, that was beautifully rinded and tasting the cheese and tasting Petite Syrah, Syrah, uh, Cap Franc and uh, Chardonnay and Viognier and, and ended up using uh, Syrah grape leaves. Uh, and then I needed a way to preserve those grape leaves. And so I work with a local distiller who creates a seed alcohol. And um, then what I source is a um, organic pears and then create simple syrup and making my own cocktail, Adam, to oh, create a, a pear liqueur yes. to preserve uh, the leaves in. So it's a part of the preserving process and those leaves are picked a year prior. So the leaves on these wheels were picked in the spring and early summer of 2019. And so they're aged and preserved in the pear liqueur and then uh, the wheel that you're tasting was also made in the autumn of 2019 and when it has that beautiful rind, uh, it's then time to wrap the wheel and slow the aging process down um, and uh, therefore preserving um, all that regionality of flavor, but adding that enhanced regionality of pears as well as Syrah um, uh, grapes. And uh, for many of you, uh, you probably know that Harry and David is based here. So this is a, a, a major pear growing capital in North America. And uh, so this cheese really encompasses all flavors of our landscape. And uh, so- An Homage to the Oregon terroir, right? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a real reflection. It's a reflection of the landscape and agriculture here 
in Southern Oregon. So, and and it must be uh, rubber. Rubber. I don't want to over romanticize it, but thinking about the fungus in your aging cellar and the microbes and everything, and you know, those, those ancient bacteria that were probably very much influenced by the volcanic ash that came that created a crater lake, you know, and it's, it, uh, but it's just so cool. It's just so cool. So layered. Yeah. So many little uh, geographical micro areas of this valley that's so unique and distinctive. So, um, and the, the, the flavor created by this rind is so distinctive. Um, there's no cheese like it. It's the most distinctive blue in the world. Some people wonder, is it really a blue? Because it has so much uh, flavor uh, from savory to um, fruit notes. So to really experience all of that flavor, what I like to do is I like to take my knife and just run it across wedge of blue so you get all those flavors and what I get from the center of the paste is I get a real fruit note so surprisingly the fruit note from the Syrah grape leaves as well as the pear liqueur is actually infused into the wheel as this wheel ages out and it goes right to the center of the wheel the center of the paste so tasting the fruit note in this point and then as you progress up into the wheel, what you'll get is a hint of blackberry. So I'm really excited to taste this blackberry honey by Jacobson Salt. You'll get a little hint of vanilla, and I'm thinking, wow, the bourbon's going to be amazing with this. A little bit of toasted filberts, hazelnuts. Oregon is the number one producer of a hazelnut. So um, mm -hmm. that flavor coming to really a representation of Oregon and then get a little bit of brown butter. And as we move uh, up into or closer to the rind, you're gonna get more savory notes and milk chocolate as well. The savory notes I like to think of as pancetta or cured bacon. So there's a lot going on in this cheese. And certainly I think we could pair this cheese with every one of the bourbons that you create, Adam. <laughs> I think it. so, yeah. It depends on where we start, so. Uh, so let's taste it if you have. Man, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I really that that uh, cocoa note is really isn't that amazing. Special, yeah. isn't it? That is fantastic. It just really comes through, and of course, uh, it's it's. I like to think of it as milk chocolate. It really enhances the vanilla flavors as well. And you're also getting those lactic calcium crystals in the center and they just yeah. have to really melt away. So it's really not only is the flavor um, really complex, but the texture as well. And not to mention the leaves. The leaves are grown at Count Borden Vineyard. It's a biodynamic organic vineyard, just a stone's throw from where I am in the Applegate Valley. So uh, they're hand-picked in the late spring and early summer, then washed and then preserved in the pear liqueur. They're so delicious. They're edible. So yeah, another enhancement of the flavor experience is tasting the cheese with a leaf. So it's a little brighter experience, and I think that will be really fun to taste with the brandy and the rye. Wow. And I... Uh... I had a feeling we were in for a treat today, so I made sure to get into the kitchen a little bit early. So my cheese is at a really perfect temperature right now, too. So mm -hmm. it's it's really a, it's delicious. It's delicious. So great that you um, mentioned. That. I like to take the cheese out um, on the counter at least an uh, hour prior to serving. So it really brings up all the flavor notes in the cheese. Uh, Sorry about that. Yeah. So good point. Thank you, Adam. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna move this. Uh, I'm gonna try this with the rye because I, I finished my bourbon with the, <laughs> with the previous cheese and then also had a little sip left to try my first bite of uh, the blue here. But I'm gonna try the rye, which is gonna be a 10 year old rye. And we're making that Kentucky style rye, which meets the 51% rye requirement, giving yourself a nice little backbone of corn. Uh, again, with rye aging up to 10 years, you're gonna start to lose a little bit of that rye punchy spice. So we talked a little bit about that punchy spice last week. But what you are gonna get, and what I noticed about this 
particular rye whiskey is in the finish, you get a fantastic, well, in the flavor and in, and in the finish, there is an amazing amount of tropical fruit. So where we had that 10-year-old bourbon bringing those dried fruits and those fruit uh, fruitcake notes that I was talking about, now I really feel like there's mango, pineapple, things like that happening in this rye whiskey. So this is a very special whiskey, came out this summer. Uh, Got some pretty positive buzz and reviews. And so you never know if it might pop up again, but hopefully you're able to find a bottle if you're in the right area. And um, I'm very excited to try this and see how they complement one another. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna skip my method. I'm going right to David's method. Nice, nice, thank you. I really enjoyed it with the rye. My rye is a little different because it's aged with a bit of pork, so. Um, has really a fruit forward note to it and you can uh, pick that up in the aromatics as you um, bring it up to your mouth. It's really special. So yeah. that really accentuates the fruit of um, yeah. the as well as the pear liqueur. The folks that have been with us for the last uh, few, few weeks here, uh, that was, we tried that dark rye on the second week. And that again is a combination of a four-year-old uh, Canadian rye, which brings some, some fruity notes, and then the eight-year-old Kentucky rye, which brings some spice, and then that addition of port uh, wine, which really kind of brings the whole party together. So that's a great, great rye for a blue cheese or something that has a really big flavor because um, that sweetness is going to just really offer a great, a nice contrast, you know, to some of those, to those notes in there. So I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying what you do have, and I'm certainly enjoying this rye here. And I think that the, again, I don't think we use this, this word very much, uh, Michael, when we were, when we've been doing this this month, but I mean, just a lot of fruitiness coming through the pairings that we've teed up this, uh, this week. You want to talk a little bit more about your perspective on that? So there's really no another comparison that I could give anybody to say, well, this is like this. It's not, this is, uh, it's, this is on its own. Um, uh, the 10 year old rye and the Rogue River Blue is perfect. You know, they just work really well. Um, I was fortunate enough that David and I a little while back did a Bold and Brave and have the 2016 version of four-year-old Rogue River Blue, which uh, I just dug into, and that's where you caught me, was I was uh, enjoying that. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's to say uh, that there's a uniqueness is an understatement. The bring out all of the flavors, the right flavors, they hold up to each other, they complement each other so much that it's just such a pleasure. And one of the things that I've always been concerned about when, when you were trying to teach somebody with using spirits versus beer or wine is the higher alcohol factor that you have. And a lot of times that can be a hot flavor, but this, you don't even notice that there's a alcohol version of this. It's just all the flavors that come out. The richness of the rye, the flavors of the cheese, the the fruitiness of that, the little bit of uh, earthiness that comes through. There's so many layers to this flavor that the last thing that you think about is that this has got this is a spirit. This is it's it's really a, a tribute to the quality of the cheese, the flavor characteristics, and of course the intense flavors that you get from this 10 year old rye is, is just amazing. I think that the, I, and I say this a lot too, uh, I, 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 you know, this cheese has so much going on for it. And I think that the rye is very complex. And when you're giving people good flavor, your brain is thinking about the pleasure of the flavor and it's not thinking about the potential pain of whatever alcohol might bring. And so even, you know, when you make a good bourbon like our Knob Creek single barrel at 120 proof, there's so much flavor going on there that, you know, you're not even thinking about the fact that you're drinking something at such a high uh, ABV. You're, you're just thinking about all the flavor rush that you're getting. And I feel like, you know, bringing the complexities here and the complexities and, and just myriad of flavors coming from the cheese. It's just a, you know, I'm, I'm just sort of repeating what you said in my own language, but it, it, it's just an amazing thing. It's really great. Really, really great. You know, and I'm really struck here because 
I, Adam and Michael, I was really concerned that the bourbons would overpower my cheeses. And what I am struck by is the balance and how they're both really enhanced. And so, Adam, as you pointed out, the fruit notes really come through in the bourbon. I mean, think yeah. about it rain right and so um and you, it's it's just so accented and you're just getting those lovely toasty notes too uh from the aging and the cask so and that's just all enhanced by this pairing and um it's it's i think easier to dissect the flavors of the blue um for me personally and that's also enhanced with this pairing as well i'm getting those flavors of cured bacon i'm getting those flavors of of, of fruit the syrah grape leaves are just really pronounced and coming yeah. through, as well as the pear note is just so enhanced and um the the heat from uh the bourbon and also i have to say the heat from the blue is so interestingly softened so yeah. and uh, what I get is those really warm butter notes and those vanilla notes coming through it's just uh, it's so delicious um, that's what I'm kind of enjoying right now in this longer this longer finish that I'm that I'm experiencing and you've got the that cocoa that, that chocolate milk or milk chocolate thing going on with the vanilla of the whiskey and it's <sighs> <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> so, uh, we did put in a little tasting guide for you all that received your packs. And so um, this is really helpful. And uh, there's a little bit of room in it to actually explore the flavors that you're experiencing with the bourbon and the cheese. But um, this is my organoleptic notes on the 2019 release, which won the world championships in October 18 of 2019. First time in US history. Um, nearly 3,000 cheeses and 300 judges. And uh, it's, it was just really one of those phone calls I'll never forget. And uh, so, um, and it's really nice that you can then go back into the booklet and look at, um, these blank pages and create this graph, um, noting the blueness, noting uh, the salt and everything that you're experiencing. And every everyone tastes things differently, so there's no wrong answer here. So I just really recommend going through the tasting. And I, I think, you know, we're talking about boozy flavors. Well, I think the booziness is actually medium in flavor when um, we taste the cheese alone, but also when we combine the cheese with um, the bourbon or the rye. So, and what really actually spiked for me was the blueness in this uh, release, and then also those peppery notes as well. Yeah, it's got a great tang, good tang. Yeah, yeah. And so there's a little room here for you to write notes about the pairing and the date, as well as where you're tasting the cheese and the bourbon. Um, one of my favorite pairings now is the Effie Cracker, right? Um, a little bit of Rogue River on that. Uh, and so we got the Effie's, um, okay, Little Rogue River. And then we're going to dive into one of my favorite preserves. It's Girl Dirt. And this preserve is actually um, heirloom pears. And uh, it's actually combined with uh, pink peppercorns. And so it's just like, wow. And what a pairing it is. And it's one of my favorite pairings with the Rogue River blue release this year. And so taste that and then taste that with the rye. And if you still have the bourbon with the bourbon, I think it'll blow you away. And then speaking about uh, blackberries as we were earlier, I think also um, trying this pairing without the preserve, but with the 
raw blackberry. And Michael was talking about crystallization because you do need a nice spreader or a spoon to put that honey on. And the crystallization as a result is it's raw and unfiltered. So um, the crystallization just occurs naturally over time. And it's usually uh, enhanced if there's like a, a bit of uh, beeswax in it. So mm -hmm. and you actually um, get it to liquefy. I like to put it on a double boiler and uh, just simmer it for a little bit and then it'll become very liquid but I really like it when I like the honey when it's crystallized like this so let's let's taste that and then taste it with the rye hmm. I've had to step back and, and wash my hands a couple of times because I've just let myself enjoy this moment <laughs> get a little get a little of this fantastic cheese on my hands wow it's just amazing how lovely that pairing is with the rye. And of course, my rye is a little different because it really has more of a pronounced fruit note with a pair uh, with the port, but it's, it's outstanding. Um, I'm gonna guess that the rind and then the leaves with the port are a pretty outstanding flavor combination. It really is, yeah, yeah. So, um, the rind is so pretty, that subtle pink is just beautiful. Isn't that gorgeous? It yeah. really is, yeah, I'm, I'm admiring it right now. It really enhances the savory note. I, that visual just takes it to another height. So what I would recommend you do, Adam, is actually just take a little bit from the rind and taste it on its own and you're mm -hmm. just, just aha moment of savory notes of bacon. It's just like, or pancetta, a lot of people like to describe it as. It's just like mind blowing. Yep. yep. Yeah. Mm. Well, really, really I focusing in on that and brings it to life. That's amazing. Mm. I had the chance to try the 2016 with this, and going back from the 2020 to the 2016. The crunchiness, there's just giant crystallization in there. And it, it's like uh, Skittle explosions uh, in the cheese of salt crystals and that. It's just magnificent. But it's... You can actually it's see the crystals. They're, they're just, they're exploding out of the 2016. I know. It was made in 2015 and it's aged in my special reserve cave. And it's just a joy that you've hung on to this piece of cheese, uh, Michael, and are talking about it today. There might be a few flights of the brave and the bold. And these are the cheeses that, um, again, I've reserved for a once in a lifetime experience. So I think April and Michelle might have a few of those flights left. So if anyone's interested, please go to our website at roguecreamery.com. And for the first time uh, in nearly 20 years, we decided to redo the label. So you can see we had a, a graphic artist uh, create a font that emulates the Rogue River. So in fluid motion, and it's really emulates um, the, the motion of the river as it moves past our dairy, uh, just so subtly, but uh, it's also always in movement. And it's certainly a source of my recreation for a number of years as a young man here and now in my adult years, and also a source of inspiration. And so we also thought we would commemorate this release um, and we included a little magnet, uh, so that should be in your pack as well. And I wanted to point out too that our new Nelly bags are also coming out. These are the perfect cheese carriers, Adam. They just went live today, so perfect. Uh, and commemorating the World Cheese Championships. And we got word yesterday that we'll continue to hold the title through 2020 so congratulations thank you so uh first time ever 
uh, in their history, uh, a cheese holds it for two years in a row. Unfortunately, it's under uh, the circumstances that we all are experiencing with this yes. pandemic. But, but you, um, you take the bright spots in 2020 where you can. You do, don't you? Yeah. 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 So um, has anyone tried the pairing with the, the Rogue River Blue with the uh, Blackberry Honey? I, I want to go right back and give that a try. And I think that's going to cause me to go back to the uh, bourbon, Adam. What do you think? I think that'd be a good choice. Yeah. I think with the addition of the honey, you don't need that, that port uh, flavor con contribution. I think kind of just going with a good bourbon, that'll, that'll do it. I just want to let you know that we didn't have any questions, but we had some nice comments. Um, thank you for emphasizing the pollinators, taking, talking about the local honey. My office building recently added urban hives to the roof, and I'm enjoying some of this first year's honey with my cheese. Oh, yeah. Nice. Oh, that's fantastic. Yes, and um, for uh, Carrie, we, we've been um, creating the pear spirits since we've uh, moved into being an organic company uh, the year of 2012. So we couldn't source organic uh, pear spirits locally. Um, so we worked with a local distiller to create the seed alcohol and worked with OSU, Oregon State University, to emulate the pear brandy that we were getting um, up in Portland. So uh, it's, it's pretty exciting. It's always fun to do and uh, always fun to sample year after year. Is that a clear, clear creek up there? Is that who you're working with? It, you're right. So I work yeah. with Steve. Um, okay. That's a funny, funny story because uh, I, I only use the pear um, brandy as a uh, a processing aid, right? To preserve uh, yeah. and because the alcohol content also sanitizes. Um, so it's pretty amazing. Um, and so the first time I had called Steve up there at Clear Creek, uh, that was nearly 20 years ago. I, he's like, you want to use my brandy, my award-winning brandy for what? <laughs> and he hung up on me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I started to buy the brandy at the Oregon Liquor Control stores around Southern Oregon, drove up to Eugene. And uh, he called me back and he said, you were serious. I said, yeah, um, I'm buying your brandy. Uh, from the liquor stores here in Oregon, the state-run liquor stores. And he said, you know, you can save yourself a bunch of money because you're just using it for a process. You can save yourself the tax. So um, we started to buy it in carboys from them. And then yeah. you, as a processing preservative for the um, leaves and then uh, moving to organic, uh, we, we, we worked with them to see if they could move to organic with us and uh, they decided that would be a big hurdle. So uh, we just started working with a local distiller here to create the seed alcohol for us to create the pears um, liqueur. So it's not a brandy, it's a liqueur. Liqueur, yeah. I use a, a Clear Creek, I think they make a cranberry uh, liqueur. Yeah. That I, I use, I actually make a Basil Hayden cocktail using that liqueur. Oh, fantastic. I bet that's outstanding. You'll have to share that with all of us. Absolutely. Well, I think maybe we're going to come back around the hall around maybe Thanksgiving. I'll make that, I'll make that cocktail. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Good. And um, I will actually put up some of the cherry plums I have on property in the Basil Hayden um, bourbon and also utilize that for my holiday. Cocktail. All right. Delicious. Yeah. You freeze, the you freeze the plums and then put them, freeze them in aluminum and then you uh, put them in the whiskey, like put them in a jar with the whiskey and just sort of let them thaw out and melt over the course of maybe two to three weeks. I think you'll be really happy with the flavor that comes out of that. Oh, good. Good. Thank you for that advice. And uh, yeah, it's 
and those will make outstanding cocktails for the holidays. Oh, this has been such a joy. Yeah, and a lot of fun. I'm so honored to release the 2020 release of Rogue River Blue today with you, Adam. It's yeah. been my honor. So thank you very much. It's been it's a it's a it's a it's a pleasure, a real pleasure. And Michael, thank you always for bringing this together and these experiences together. It's always just so fun. I always learn something about a pairing and I learned a lot about pairing rye and bourbon together. I just was a little anxious. I thought, oh, my cheese is going to be overpowered. But wow, they just were so in sync with the bourbon. Like the land of the pairing Jedi. So we can yeah, you know, yeah. trust them. Yeah. Well, thank you. Michael surprised me uh, many a time once we started a pairing with blue. And uh, normally blue is like the end of the pairing. Sure. We'll start with a mild cheddar, work to a flavored cheddar, then work to an aged cheddar, and then work to a, a blended milk cheddar that has a lot of age, and then we'll go into the blues. But this time, Michael said, maybe we're going to start with your blue. <laughs> I just... <laughs> Well, I think uh, love the expression on my face, but it was the best pairing of that day. It was so much. Yes, we had a beautiful Alberino that we paired up with it. Oh. It was just magnificent. And when I was doing the tasting, it was like, oh, we're going to start with this. And, you know, that's, you know, we all, all of us on the panel, you know, they were all, you know, what are you thinking? You know, you're going to kill our, you're going to kill our cheeses for the rest <laughs> of the time, you know? <laughs> It was beautiful. It was beautiful. It was. Sometimes it was. you have to take those risks, and I'm glad that we got a chance to be able to, uh, uh, all, all of us to be able to come together to enjoy the Rogue River Blue release, to be able to enjoy the uh, cheddar, the, the bourbons, and that. And I have to say uh, on a personal note that uh, I've had the best time on these, this uh, four-part series and uh, every Thursday afternoon has been an experience that I've never had before. And today it was the top of all of the four. So this was magnificent. David, thank you so much for, you know, being here. The beautiful, yes, the beautiful cheeses, the uh, uh, time together, the bourbons, everything was magnificent. And the pairings, uh, putting that together, you know, is just beyond what you could expect from having these items, how well they work together, how bold and beautiful each of them are. So I want to thank you guys for, you know, bringing this to me and sharing this with all of uh, the people that are watching and those hopefully that We'll watch it recorded for eons to come. <laughs> <laughs> it's been it's been an amazing month, Michael, and I, I've really gotten a kick out of getting to know you and share these these hours every week together and get to get to talk about some some fantastic flavors and ingredients and, and heritage and processes. And, and David, it's just it's that's a it's a real real special pleasure getting to meet you as well. This has been a lot of fun getting to talk uh, talk about pairings together. Yeah, it's been a delight. Um, always a delight, Adam. And thank you, Michael. Always um, a delight to share um, these experiences with you. And uh, I always take something away. And uh, again, this is one of those exceptional pairings and moments. And really was. Really was. Hope everybody at home has enjoyed it as much as we have. I think. And I want everyone to know I, I am an apiarist. I do have bees and I see the question here. Um, the bees did survive. I've been watching them very closely. So um, uh, thankfully, they're doing well in my bee yard. And so, um, and the leaf wrap is actually a way of preserving um, the bee linens and the yeast on the rind as well. So that you, that way you get to experience it with the Rogue River Blue. So I hope that answers your question on the leaf wrap. Um, Don't forget to share the information about the fundraiser when you, when you, when you host it. Thank you. I'll do that uh, when I get off this call. I'll send it over to you, Michael. Thank you. 
All right. So um, I hate to do it because uh, this could go on all night with us <laughs> drinking and enjoying the cheeses. But Who knows? I might open these bottles if we keep talking. Yeah. <laughs> you know, luckily, I had a little bit there, but I got the 10-year rye, I got the rye, and I got the regular. So I'm going to be set for a little bit, you know. Enjoy I'll be that. Doing all right. Um, well, and, it's 2 uh, o'clock here, so I have a full day ahead of me here. So. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm going to uh, move this over for enjoy it a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to save uh, this for our event on Tuesday, October 13th at 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time or 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific Daylight Time. And then we'll kind of do this again, but a different direction. Thank you, really Michael. Great time. I'm looking forward to it. Adam, thank you. Thank you. Really nice day. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank, thank you, you again all. so much. I can't, I can't express how much I love having you guys on and how much I'm going to miss you from here. And well, we'll do some more. David, I'll see you in shortly. And Adam, we'll figure out something more to do so we can continue being able to enjoy cheese and also uh, some fantastic bourbons, man. Pretty good company, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> All right. Take care, everybody. All right, guys. You take care. We'll see you soon. All right. Thank you all. Bye now. Bye-bye now.